Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, once again, my name is uh, Bradley Burkar, and I'm from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and I'll be talking about RNA synthesis at hydrothermal vents. So we've gotten away from the geology somewhat, and we're talking about RNA synthesis um, and more geochemistry, biochemistry-related li stuff. Um, I'd like to point out one awesome thing about this research that's going on is this research came directly out of a collaboration that started from AbGradCon last year with Lori Barge at JPL. So she flew out to my laboratory for two weeks. We set up all of these experiments as a preliminary start to this project. So yay, AbGradCon. <laughs> So once again, I'll give you a, a brief overview of the um, RNA world just to help set the stage for what I'm gonna be talking about here. So the premise of the RNA world starts with um, essentially a sea of nucleotides. You can take it back a bit further and talk about how you create nucleotides and all of that jazz. But for the purpose of this, we're gonna assume that nucleotides have been formed in some manner. So one of the tricks becomes trying to get these nucleotides into these long strands of RNA. So you need some sort of catalytic uh, chemical system to generate long strands of RNA. And the theory is once you start generating strands of RNA, eventually some of these strands will have certain uh, base sequences that can fold into interesting manners and create uh, ribozymes and some catalytic activities. So eventually these strands can operate on each other to cause replication and so you have a system of replication in biochemistry using RNA as the main uh, biochemical um, uh, constituent of the system. And then eventually sequences get sampled that create DNA and proteins out of the system in which they eventually start to supplant RNA as they're better at containing information or better at doing the biochemistry and they supplant RNA and we have modern organisms and modern life as we know it with the DNA and the protein system with RNA that helps out every once in a while to do the rest of this stuff. Uh, and so this is how you get from a world based solely on RNA to modern organisms. And the main focus of my research is looking at the step one as I have depicted here, trying to get these nucleotides somehow to come together to overcome their energy barriers to create these long chains of RNA. So what I've been looking at is these hydrothermal systems as possible sort of chemical incubators for uh, creating these RNA molecules. And so the hydrothermal systems I'm looking at are a little bit different than a lot of people have been talking about in the last couple days, as they aren't magma driven. They don't have the extremely hot multi um, hundreds of degrees Celsius water that's coming out of them. Um, they're just nice, warm to semi-hot water systems that form at the bottom of the ocean or possibly at the bottom of Europa. As long as you have some water system and some mineral system, you can possibly get this sort of formation forming. And so the main energy source for these serpentization chimneys is from the serpentization reaction, which you take olivine, which is a very ubiquitous uh, mineral found in the Earth's crust, you react it with basically water, and you create serpentine, some high energy uh, chemical molecules, and a lot of energy. And so this chemical reaction generates heat energy and high energy compounds to do interesting biochemistry with. And if you mix things in there like carbon dioxide or sulfur, you can create magnetite, if you add some uh, silicon, you can create a silicate, and you can create a hydrogen sulfur, things like this. So you can get some nice high energy chemical compounds just from chemistry. Yay, chemistry. <laughs> and so um, these serpentization chimneys are located off center from the ridge volcanoes, uh, where you see the nice uh, black smokers and all the really um, warm sites. These take place between 40 degrees and 90 degrees Celsius, which is good because if you get too hot, you start to worry about the problems of uh, degrading the RNA that you could possibly be forming. Uh, the pH from the chemical reactions actually make this alkaline. So on a primordial earth, you would have the alkaline uh, vents out get, or outpouring into an acidic ocean from the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in it. 
In the modern day oceans, these form these uh, calcium carbonate, these giant white chimneys, which these would not have been present in a prebiotic earth because the um, pH of the oceans is thought to have been much lower than it is today. And an interesting note for astrobiology is uh, a lot of uh, some modern life forms can survive at these completely independent of energy from the sun. So if you're looking at this from the early Archean as a possible source of biochemistry, it provides enough high energy compounds to be able to have living systems. And so if you are able to synthesize life at these vents, it could be completely self-sustaining without having to worry about photon capture, UV light, or any other outputs other than what is provided at these chimney sites. And so this is the experimental setup as it looks like in the laboratory. We have a, uh, we have a simple ocean setup that's rich in uh, ferrous iron, as uh, the talk before has shown that uh, iron too would have been a very important constituent of the early Earth ocean. A little bit salty, uh, we purge it of all of the oxygen in there and just create a nitrogen environment above it. So we try to keep it anoxic and iron rich. And from the bottom, we inject uh, some uh, sodium sulfide, sodium chloride, the silicate, and other reaction constituents into it to create these nice little black chimneys that can form in there. And so here's a nice time sequence that you can see of the chimney growth over the minutes of reaction. So you can see it gets bigger and bigger. And uh, these structures are hollow structures that have a membranous a membrane on the outside that can actually um, support the transfer of molecules from the inside to the outside. It's a pH gradient, and it creates a energy, um, an energy uh, gradient that can drive reactions, which the talk after mine is going to discuss in a lot more detail. So just keep in mind, pH gradient, energy gradient, it's hollow with the membrane and stuff can pass through. And so, so here's some... Uh, environmental scanning electron mic my, uh, microscopy images to show what it looks like up close and personal. Um, another interesting thing is these chimneys have been shown to be able to incorporate some very small organics into them. And so in these ESEM images, it's uh, some small peptides that have been directly incorporated into the walls that have formed. And it changes the morphology that is seen um, uh, with the iron sulfide surfaces. And so the incorporation changes how they grow, and it also provides possible sites that uh, catalysis could happen on, maybe some interesting protein interactions, things like that. Uh, this has also been shown with some yeast that's been taken from, uh, or some RNA that has been extracted from yeast, and this long sequence of RNA has been shown to be incorporated into the iron sulfide chimneys as well. And this is a great close-up showing the inside of the chimney versus the outside and these little compartments that can actually trap some organic molecules and that uh, you can get a lot of membranous transport through. So this is a picture of the setup in our laboratory. Um, so under our typical reaction conditions, we form, instead of those gnarly looking or, or uh, calcium-based chimneys, we form these nice iron sulfide mounds that are still hollow and still have the membranes on the outside. If you really ramp up the concentrations, you get these really cool looking gnarly structures that are pretty photogenic, so they're nice to show. <laughs> but this um, is probably unrealistic for an early Earth, uh, but who knows? It's hard to know exactly what the concentrations of all the chemicals were back in the day. Uh, so what? Our project started to do over the couple of weeks was to incorporate some of these small molecules into the growing chimneys that we have, um, notably amino acids and some of the uh, base pairs, so some small nucleotides, as the amino acids might encourage um, interesting polymerization reactions that could happen. Uh, so one of the things that we're focusing on is glycine because it would have been very ubiquitous. And proline, as proline itself has been shown to have some catalytic properties, uh, just um, free form in solution, most notably with a homochiral formation of different sort of uh, amino acids or RNA. And also it's thought that by incorporating some of the uh, 
nucleotides into the walls of the chimneys, it might promote aggregation to the chimneys by providing nice pairing sites, which could promote uh, adenosine or guanosine, for example, to be drawn to the chimney. And something that I'll point out that's very important to what our lab group does in this experiment in particular is we use uh, this mineral catalyst and an activated nucleotide to drive a bunch of our reactions. And so this is something else that we're going to incorporate into the, that we have incorporated in the chimneys, is our montmorillonite clay, which under some prebiotic reactions has been shown to encourage oligomerization. And we use normal nucleotides and these imidazolated uh, nucleotides, which help to speed up the reaction and some reactions are or some reactions don't get completed unless you have this imidazolated activated nucleotide. And so some of our uh, initial results from this, since a lot of our reactions showed nothing. It's a very, uh, it's first time this has been attempted, and so we run a lot of tests to try to figure out what works and what doesn't. So one of the things that we discovered worked at a very small degree was the chimneys that were formed with U and P incorporated into the side. And so this is a, our mass spec data, which is a good way to um, determine the composition of solutions based upon the mass of the molecules that are in there. And this has shown that we created up to uh, oligomers that are four units in length. And so it shows that we get a small amount of oligomerization in this reaction with UMP in the chimney and this one used the activated AMP that we had, so the imidazolated. But it shows we got some degree of success from these chimney formations. Uh, and so one of the subsequent experiments that we followed up was using the montmorillonite clay as an ocean floor to actually uh, have the iron sulfide, or the, the sulfide reaction come through the bottom to see if the combination of the um, the creation of the chimneys with the catalytic clay had an effect upon it. And what we saw was with IMPA, we got the polymerization like we saw before. So this one has no UMP in it, just the clay as the ocean floor. But what's interesting, we've never observed this in the laboratory before, is with AMP, with the non-activated nucleotide, we got a distinct uh, dimer here, which could be pyrophosphate, it could be um, a small RNA molecule, and it's arguable whether or not we have a threemer in there. But we haven't seen this dimer before and a very small amount of threemer, so it shows like this oligomerization reaction could be successful. And also, I'll point out from this, we are showing a, a strong iron aggregate effect in these reactions, as we know iron is drawn to RNA from the previous talk, and so we can see that in our reaction analysis as well. And so the initial results show that clay and UMP are incorporated into the growing chimneys. That's from data that I had it presented, but we have verified that it is actually incorporated into the structure. And like I said, we observed minor ligamer formation with UMP and with the catalytic clay with activated and non-activated nucleotides. And we've observed some initial iron clustering as well. And once again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lori Barge for working with me on this in our very intensive project. <laughs> um, my group members and a group at RPI that we work along with, and of course, the Astrobiology Institute for providing funding for this project. Thank you. All right, we have time for one quick question, if anyone has anything. Hey, those small peptides with um, like lysine and uh, alanine, were those forming on their own? Were they Oh no, those were preformed oh, pre and just incorporated in as a test of concept to see if it was possible. Did you, uh, and you were putting in amino acids into your model? And um, did you ever try from that? From the same reaction that you're looking at? Or did you ever try putting amino acids and seeing if they would maybe polymerize? Not. Oh, um, I have not done that. Tides. I think work's been done on that. I know that some of the hydrothermal systems, I'm not sure if it's the hot ones or the cooler ones, have been shown to promote some uh, amino, or some of the organic amino acid formations, and I'm not sure if it forms peptides or proteins, but we did investigate that as part of this um, setup. Okay, cool. All right, thanks, Brad. Thank you.